James chapter 2. Uh, we're going to continue in our series in this amazing book that is often called the Proverbs of the New Testament. And so find James chapter 2. I think we might also end up in 1 Corinthians 1. So if you want to put a bookmark there in 1 Corinthians 1, that way uh, when I... When I call out 1 Corinthians 1 later on, you can just be right there. It won't take any time at all. You'll be prepared in advance. All right. All right, James chapter 2. Uh, the title of the message this morning is this. Incompatible interactions. I'm quite proud of my, my title and my title graphic. Uh, but really, the, the most important thing is the truth that comes from this. Incompatible. Incompatible. Let me give you the definition of incompatible. <laughs> Two things that are unable to exist together harmoniously. Incompatible. As the title suggests, we're going to talk about two different interactions, two different things that are compatible, incompatible with each other. They can't thrive harmoniously one with another. So as I thought about this, it reminded me of a few other incompatible interactions that I've experienced in life. Would you like to hear about them? <laughs> One time I went to the movie theater. I was really excited about watching a movie. Everyone had been raving about it. But there was someone else there in the theater who was also excited to see the movie. It was a mom with her cute little baby. Did y'all connect the dots yet? She was so excited to watch the movie that she decided to stay in there as cute little baby cried the whole service. Uh, the, a movie. <laughs> Precious little girl. You've been there before. If you've been there before, is that, a, is that a blessing to you? Did you enjoy that movie? You walk away not remembering the greatness of the movie, but remember. <laughs> I mean, moms are great and little babies are great. But moms and little babies in a movie theater are incompatible. Come on, that was good right there. Okay, you didn't like that one, so I came with the second one here. You just boarded the airplane. Hadn't taken off yet. We could probably think of a variety of incompatible interactions here, right? <laughs> you just boarded the airplane. You're waiting for the crew to, you know, finalize everything, and they're getting ready to take off, and... person across the aisle is having this conversation with his homie, and I do mean homie, on Facebook. No, FaceTime. FaceTime conversation. You know what that means? Everything's audible. It's like the speaker, uh, the speaker's out. So I hear not only what he is saying, I hear what his friend, the homie on the other side is saying. So does the entire plane. I don't need to hear your conversation. Am I being too harsh this morning? Am I the only one that feels this way? Y'all are staring at me like, man, you're a jerk. <laughs> FaceTime conversations on a full airplane, incompatible interactions. I came ready for one more. This one's personal to me. You're out hiking or mountain biking a trail. It's beautiful. Mountains, cool breeze, sun is setting, those pink clouds in the sky, and, and uh, birds chirping, and uh, the, uh, the uh, um, desert uh, cactus are out there, and just, uh, just enjoying nature, you've escaped the chaos of civilization. Someone is also hiking and has decided to bring the chaos of civilization with them. 
that everyone came out to try to escape by having his little mini Bluetooth boombox with its beats in his backpack blaring that everyone else in the trail can hear. I feel like I'm not being very Christian right now. And I'm just thinking, I came out here to escape the chaos. Why are you bringing the chaos? <laughs> Hiking and the homie with the boombox, incompatible interactions. I'm feeling a little guilty right now, like I need to repent for even mentioning these things. All three of these examples have two different interactions that, that exist together but not harmoniously. In James chapter 2, God's going to address another incompatible interaction, but this one is for anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ. With that in mind, I want you to stand with me. James 2, and let's read the first nine verses. James 2, starting in verse number one. My brethren, so he's talking to believers here, have not the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Now he's going to illustrate what this means or what this would look like. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man with vile raiment, and ye have respect or, or favoritism to him that weareth the gay clothing, the nice clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place. And then you say to the poor, um, we got a spot back there in the corner for you. S -s stand, stand back here and, uh, or under my footstool. Verse 4, are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of what kind of thoughts? Evil thoughts. Evil thoughts. Verse, uh, verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you? What's the answer to that? Yes. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit, what's that next word? And are convinced of the law as transgressors. Incompatible interactions. Let me clarify before I pray here in just a minute that having money, having possessions is not bad. It can be bad. It's not bad if done the right way. So James is not saying, man, if you're rich, you're a bad person. That's not what he's saying at all, at all. He's talking about incompatible interactions. My great God, I pray that you would take the truth. May it... May it have a free course in our hearts, in our lives this morning. We'll praise you for what you'll do. We ask it in Christ's name. Everyone say it. God bless you. you. may be seated. So we've started chapter 2 here. We've left chapter 1. But James hasn't changed his focus from where he ended in chapter number 1. Let me show you. Go back to verse 26, would you please? Verse 26, it says, if any man among you seem to be religious, if there's anyone that claims to have a spiritual walk, but he doesn't bridle his tongue, this man deceives his own heart, and the man's religion is what? So James is focusing on what authentic spirituality looks like in our lives from a practical position. And what he's saying here is when there's an authentic, authentic spiritual walk, Christ has taken over the commands of the tongue. There's a controlled conversation. Amen and amen. And, and then he hits another angle of authentic spirituality in verse 27. We've preached this already, but look at it. Verse 27, pure religion. 
right? So an authentic spiritual walk, pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The world shouldn't show up in your life. The way the world acts, the way the world thinks, the way the world conducts itself, the values of the world, it shouldn't show up in your life if you have an authentic walk with God. And you should minister to the most vulnerable of society, widows and the fatherless. That's what authentic spirituality looks like. Okay, so then he's going to continue that same line of thinking. He still has the same focus in mind, but now he's going to specifically call out an incompatible interaction that believers sometimes find themselves guilty of, and that is having respect of persons, as James calls it here. I want to point out four things from our passage about incompatible interactions. Number one, I want you to see the command against incompatible interactions. Go back to verse number one. Look at it again, would you please? My brethren... Have not the faith of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, so look up here. That's interaction number one. Uh, a person who claims to have faith in Jesus Christ. I have a walk with Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. Interaction number one. Okay, what's the second interaction? The last part of verse number one, with respect to persons. And so, James is making it crystal clear that having respect of persons, having favoritism towards someone who claims, uh, and, and you do that while claiming to be a believer of Jesus Christ, those, those two things don't go together harmoniously. That, that demonstrates that, that there needs to be an adjustment in your spiritual walk. Well, what does respect of persons mean? We don't use that term. That's not in our vernacular today. What does that mean? It's interesting. The phrase in English, respect of persons, three words, is actually one big long Greek word. <laughs> I didn't want to try to say it, so I just show it to you. <laughs> Pastor Carr, can you say that word? Go ahead and try it. So go ahead. Some of you want to. You want to, want don't to. you? Don't you? You bunch of chickens. <laughs> Guess what? I came prepared. I'll, I'll let you listen to it. Play, play the sound. Yeah, that. Okay, you ready? Say it. Pros hey, good job. You know Greek. That's awesome. I love it. Okay, big fancy word here. Here's what it simply means. To, to have favoritism or to show par partiality towards someone for improper reasons. Now, it's okay to show favoritism or uh, to, to hold someone in high regard for the right reasons, because of character, because of virtue. But for improper reasons, that's what James is talking about. More specifically, in our context, it's speaking about, now I want you to get this, about making judgments about other people based primarily on appearances, by what you see based on external or superficial factors it means that you make decisions about how you will interact with someone based upon what you can see based upon external things rather than attempting to get to know that person and understand who they really are to understand their character their true merits their abilities that's what this is talking about so James provides an example of what he's talking about, and we read about it here. He talks about uh, a church service. He says, if there come upon uh, your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and then a poor man with vile raiment. And so he's talking about an assembly, a, a church service. And you have two different people that walk in, and, and, and so he draws his attention to these two people. And, and then he draws our attention to how these two people are treated differently based solely on how they look. The man with nice clothes and uh, other external characteristics, it, it exhibits that this man has money, that this man's been successful to some degree, or he's faking it. Sometimes that can happen too. You're not, you're really, you're not really successful, but you, you, you love 
you love superficial things, so you make yourself look more successful than what you really are. And, and so this person has nice clothes, and, and it's made obvious that this person is wealthy, and we can look at someone like that, and, and we can think, well, maybe this person can help me more than that person over there that doesn't look like they have a lot of money, that doesn't look like they have a lot of success. The other person doesn't come from the same financial resources. That's obvious also by his external apparel. The interaction with the rich man is such that it demonstrates, oh, we value you because you look nice, because you look like you have money, because you look like you're successful. We value, ooh, come sit right up here in the VIP section. I watched a documentary on Hillsong. And specifically, it was the Hillsong in New York City with uh, Pastor Carl Lentz. And, uh, you know, he had a Bieber. Is it, uh, is it Justin Bieber? Was like one of the big dogs that would come to his church along with uh, uh, other big dog celebrities. And he had a VIP section that only if you were extremely successful. No, you can't just sit in this se section unless you're successful. So, so that happens. But any church can be guilty of this. Any church. Conservative churches, liberal churches, and everything in between. We make evaluations when someone walks in the door based on how they're dressed and how they look. I'm like, man, you got it together. I want to make sure I treat you right. You're someone I'd like to get to know. James is talking about how we, how we judge people simply by what we can see. And he's calling our attention to the times when believers determine how they will interact with others based solely upon appearances or external factors without taking the time to truly get to know the person's true heart, true merits, true abilities, true characters. A character, and when believers foolishly make judgments about a person's worth or importance by the shallowness of appearances, it is completely incompatible with Christ. That's what he's saying. James is saying, don't have this kind of faith. I want to give you a, a true statement that we can extract from this. It's somewhat wordy, but I want you to listen to it. Believers who are serious about being Christ-like will refuse to let external appearances or stereotypes determine how they interact with others. Believers who are really serious about walking with Christ will not look upon you evaluate how you're dressed, evaluate how your hair looks, the shoes, and then say, oh, hmm, a little bit nervous about engaging you. I'm not sure you can do much for me, but this person over here, this looks like someone maybe they could help me, someone I would enjoy. And so, you, and so if you're serious about your walk with Christ, you don't base how you'll interact with someone upon appearances alone. That's what James is saying. It means that you will determine to treat everyone with the same kind of respect, the same kind of dignity, no matter what they look like. Amen. James uses the rich and the poor to illustrate this truth, but don't think that James is saying that the affluent is the problem. The affluent isn't the problem here. That's not what he's saying at all. Having nice things, that's not the problem. Having nice jewelry, that's not the problem. No, 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 what James is, he's calling out uh, when you automatically assume someone is good or someone is important or someone is valuable, someone can do something for you based simply upon what you observe visually from that person based on their appearances. James is pointing out that, that um, the outside of someone doesn't tell the whole story. That's a good statement right there. The outside of what you see doesn't tell the whole story. In fact, it tells very little of the story. James is pointing out that you can make a lot of flawed judgments when you base them upon what someone looks like. So this is God's command against incompatible interactions. God is saying, if you're a Christian, don't judge people by what you see on the outside. Now, I'm going to come back to this thought. Oh, that means that what we look like on the outside doesn't matter. 
Oh, that's not what James is saying, but I'll come back to that. Yeah, I got that at the last point right there because uh, I might rabbit trail and spend too much time there, but we'll come back to that towards the end of the message. I'm John. I'm Ryan. Ryan, I have no clue about you. <laughs> but we're all prone to, when we first meet someone, I mean, we, our mind does it automatically, doesn't it? It just sizes people up, D doesn't it? I mean, and, and all of us, look, all of us have to fight against that. I don't know anything about you. And, and so if before I make any kind of evaluation about you, you if I'm a Christian, you know what I should do? I'm going to take time to know Ryan. Ryan, R or B? R. R. Okay, all right. I want to take time to know Ryan. I want to know, all right, uh, how long you've lived in Arizona? Did you grow up here? What do you do for work? And, you know, does that make sense? All of us have to work on this. And so if we're a Christian, we refuse to determine how I'm going to interact with someone based on what they look like externally. That's the first point that I see James making. The second point, this is huge, that James points out is this the thinking of incompatible interactions he james is going to explain something about your thinking process when you begin to determine how you'll interact with others based on appearance appearances look at verse four again are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts and so james is saying when you determine or when you make judgments about how you treat someone based primarily upon external factors rather than taking time to get to know that person you are wrong and you're guilty of evil thinking notice how james goes on to highlight how this thinking is completely foreign to how god thinks to how god interacts verse number five hearken my beloved brethren hath not god chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him god says uh, most people look at this person over here and say this person is hopeless look at how they're dressed look at the family they came from they come from the south side no that matters to me i look through all the external i look on the potential on the inside those are the people i choose and God does choose rich people from time to time. He, he does. David was affluent. Solomon was affluent. Abraham was affluent. But God didn't choose them because they were affluent. God chose them because of what he saw on the inside. Does that make sense? And so God refused to determine his interactions with others by looking at anything superficial or external. God doesn't care how much money a person has. It's never affected how he's, how he's interacted with a person. God doesn't care if a person is poor and has a lifestyle that the world would never celebrate. God doesn't care if the person didn't graduate from high school. God is looking on the inside. God doesn't care what kind of car a person drives. God doesn't care how many letters or initials are behind a person's name and title. He'll, try, he'll treat the high school dropout with as much care and love and potential as he does those that are doctors and and uh, lawyers and the highest of the high highest uh from an occupational scale he doesn't look at the external he looks on the inside and says i'll use you based on what i can see on the inside gracious sakes that's how god works i just thought about uh, some of the examples of this in the bible god chose moses Oh, but God chose Moses, man, because, man, he was like big dog in Egypt. He was, wasn't he? He was big dog in Egypt. The Bible says he was learned in all the ways of Egypt. He was a man with the, of, uh, and I forget the specific terminology, mighty in, I believe it says this, mighty in word and deed. You say, yeah, but Moses said he didn't know how to speak. Yeah, that was an excuse. The Bible says he was mighty in word and deed. Okay, so God chose him because of that. Oh, no. It, you'll, you'll know if you know the story. God waited until Moses tried to accomplish God's will his own way and then failed. And you know what Moses did after that? After he tried to succeed his own way? Say it again. After he tried to succeed his own way and failed, he ran. He ran to the desert. It's interesting because... The Egyptians view shepherds 
as an abomination. Guess what Moses ended up being? A shepherd for his father-in-law in a place like liberal Kansas, places that nobody's ever heard of before. <laughs> Backside of nowhere. God didn't care that all his uh, people that knew him before, if they were to look at him now as a shepherd and say, what a disgusting way of life. God didn't care about any of that. He said, I see potential in this man. I'm going to use him. God used Moses. How about another story? Can I just tell you another story? <laughs> oh, what's next here? Oh, yeah. God interacted with a very sinful woman in Jericho who just needed the right opportunity to respond to God. She just needed the right opportunity. We don't know anything about her background. And God looked beyond her harlot attire. God looked beyond the reputation and saw the potential of when he would touch her heart. And God determined to interact with her, not based on how she looked on the outside, but on the potential that was on the inside. Hallelujah. And God used her and her lineage to bring forth the Messiah. Wow. Some of you didn't know that, did you? That's our God. Amen. If you just let him, just let loose of the reins of your life and surrender just like she did. Got to use you in great ways. Can I give you another example? Y'all are listening so well tonight to this morning. God chose a teenage boy. He was the youngest of all his brothers. He, he became the most feared warrior and the most feared leader in all of Israel, but not even his father, while he was living under his father's reign, not even his father recognized the potential of the youngest. But God looked at it. He said, I see something down in there beyond the superficial. I see beyond what everyone else sees or what everyone else doesn't see. And I'm going to use this man in the, one of the greatest ways that I've ever used a man before. To be the greatest leader and warrior in Israel who ended up writing the book of Psalms. One of the greatest books of praise of God that any man has ever written. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can I give you one more? <laughs> Jesus chose an immoral woman that he met at a well, started a conversation. He initiated the conversation with her. She lived in Samaria. God chose this immoral woman to start a revival in Samaria. <laughs> when the disciples showed up and they saw Jesus talking to this woman, they knew immediately that this woman was not of good virtue. And they didn't say it out loud, just like you and I don't say often what we're thinking out loud. Praise the Lord for that. But Jesus could read their thoughts, and, and they were thinking, why would you ever talk to someone as low class as her? And yet this is who God used to start a revival in Samaria. Why? Because God doesn't look on the outside. He looks beyond all of that, sees the potential on the inside. And when you begin to determine how you'll interact with people based on anything visual, based on externals, based on appearances, based on how much money they have, based on how successful they appear to be, you are not only evil, you are not thinking like God. And being a Christian is about being like God. And so it's uh, the thinking of incompatible interactions, gracious sakes. Let me just show this to you. I, I, we have time to do this. Don't lose your place in James. I told you to bookmark 1 Corinthians, didn't I? Did you do that? Were you obedient? 1 Corinthians 1, look at verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, 
Not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. The world would look at the things that God uses and he would, and, and the world says, that'll never work. That is bogus. That is weak. Why would you ever do anything like that? And God says, those are the things that I use to change and transform a life, to raise a person up, to raise a man up, to raise a woman up, to raise a mother up, a father up, children up, to use them in ways to impact the world in mighty ways. Those are the kind of people that I use. Gracious sakes. Brother Carr, gracious sakes. I can't believe I'm here in Scottsdale. If you knew how I grew up, I mean, it's not like we were redneck. I just... My my etiquette and skills, I'm still working on that, right? <laughs> still working on that. But I just remember my teenage years walking around, and I'm sorry to admit this, but I just, this is my way of life, walk around with a little wife beater shirt, and just, I w didn't go to church, and I just was so rough around the edges. I'm still rough, but I, I just can't believe I ended up in Scottsdale. I didn't grow up around the affluent. And God chose me to come here. <laughs> Not because I'm qualified, but because he's great and he can take all the junk that is, he can see, see through all the outward roughness and he can say, I can still use you if you let me. Amen. God can do the same for you. Gracious sakes. It's the thinking of the incompatible. Let me give you the... Third thing, the association of incompatible interactions. The association. So James had he made it clear that judging people by outward external factors is totally incompatible with Christ. But now James is going to, going to tell us that not only is this thinking not associated with Christ, it's incompatible with Christ. Not only is it not associated with Christ, the bigger problem is who it is associated with. Verse 6, But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you? Now, now again, he's not, he's not highlighting that rich men are sinful by nature. The context is rich men who don't have a care in the world about God. Do not rich men oppress you, draw you before judgment seats. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called. Look, when you judge people by external things, by how they look, by how much money they have, by how nice their clothes are, by the shoes they wear, by the house they live in, by the car they drive. When you do that, you are acting and thinking and associated just like those who deny God, who hate God, who have no appetite for God. Don't do that. We're supposed to be, and all that we do, James is making the point, I'm supposed to be associated that I belong to God, that I'm his child. But when I judge you based on the external, I don't show that at all. I actually associate more with those that don't love God and care about the things of God. And so, those are the associations of incompatible associations, and incompatible interactions. Now, I, I want to give you a, one final point. The final point is the lessons, the lessons of incompatible interactions. Now, I have six. Now, don't worry. I'm just going to mention these. Six. Ah, it's almost lunchtime. No, it's not. We're getting close. But I just want to mention these because now that we have this truth, I want you to see what does this look like practically in your life? What is this truth that, that I'm not supposed to judge people on external things? What does that look like in my life? And I want to be able to give you six practical lessons. You ready? Number one, judging people by their appearances will cause you to make bad decisions that can hurt and negatively affect 
the people you're judging so bad. Being passed over for a pro promotion by your supervisor for someone who lacks the same character you've exhibited, that lacks the same performance that you've exhibited in the workplace. And, and when you've worked and sacrificed for your supervisor, you've been over backwards to try to be accommodating to his desires and listen to him when he's uh, come down hard on you. You've been over backwards, and yet, and you, you are the one that's most qualified, and yet you get overlooked, and he ends up picking someone who's not as qualified but as schmoozed, maybe a woman who has leveraged her personality and her looks to make connections. I'm just saying that that can be, that can be so deeply frustrating when that happens, doesn't it? And we ought not to be, as Christians, we ought not to uh, be that source of pain and and uh, a negativity towards someone. It can be very discouraging. Sometimes parents can do this with their kids. And they show favoritism based on outward abilities, based on appearances. It's in the Bible. There's all kinds of examples in the Bible. That, that carries the potential of permanently scarring children and hindering them in ways that only God can overcome in supernatural fashion as an adult. Amen and amen. When one of your closest friends begins to set you aside in order to spend time with another person who has more to offer, that can be really painful. And so, practically speaking, when, when you judge people by their appearances, it'll cause you to make bad decisions that hurts uh, and negatively affects that person that you're judging. Let me give you the second lesson. Now, this one is important. I want you to listen to this. Judging people by their appearance can cause you to make bad decisions that hurts you and negatively affects you. You choose a friend because they're popular. You choose a friend because they have the right kind of uh, possessions. They have the right kind of reputation. Uh, not, not based on character, but everyone loves them. Maybe you choose a business partner because of superficial things, or you choose a sports team for your kids or you make any other kind of life decision and you base it only upon the external factors or superficial factors, what can happen is that you, you are drawn to something because it looks nice on the outside, but what it looks like on the outside is actually disguising what it looks like on the inside. And so you're moving forward in this decision, whether it's with a job or a potential job because on the outside it looks good or a friendship uh, for you and it looks good, a relationship, it looks good on the outside for you. And I'm saying what's on the outside can disguise a, a lot of wickedness and lacking character on the inside. And so if you're going to only make a judgment upon external things, you can hurt yourself by um, uh, making friends or making relationships that you'll later regret after the veneer, after you see through the veneer of the outside, and you're like, oh my goodness. But by that time, you're already stuck. You can mess up your kids. You mess up your kids by a, choosing a sports team or choosing whatever, whatever kind of program because it looks good on the outside because everyone thinks, oh, this is great. And you're just making external judgments. You have no idea what's on the inside. You got to have God to give you discernment to see what's on the inside. And you send your kids down that group or down that school or down whatever. And, and on the outside, it looks great. But on the, uh, on the inside, man, there's depravity and wickedness. I heard from someone in this room, I heard about a choice of school that now as an adult, but as a kid, their, their parents set for them. And on the outside, man, it looks so good. Nice building, nice education, uh, well, uh, 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 teachers with, with credentials, but all kinds of depravity under the surface. 
all kinds of depravity. They said it negatively impacted me. You can make decisions for your kids based on external things, and it can come back to hurt you. Amen and amen. That's lesson number two. Lesson number three. Judging a person by their appearance will cause you not to witness to others like you should. You know you're supposed to be a witness if you're a Christian? You're supposed to tell as many people as you can about Jesus. I imagine that's why you showed up here. She invited you to church, I would imagine. Amen and amen. We're supposed to invite people and tell people about Jesus. And there's people that your first assessment of them would be something like this. They'll never listen. Or uh, they look scary. <laughs> it makes me think of the time I was in Walmart and I, I was, uh, I think, in the fishing, like the fishing or sporting goods section of Walmart and this, this big old, big old dude had tats all over him and, uh, you know, it just kind of looked like a Harley Davidson kind of guy, you know, just big and bulky. And I felt like the Lord said, I want you to talk to that guy. And I was like, no way. He's not, he's, he's going to be like, bing. <laughs> Thankfully, the Lord, you know, there's been times when I, I haven't listened to the Lord and I just hold to that and I disobey. But thankfully, this time, I, I, the Lord convinced me. And so I went up to him and I was so shocked because when I engaged him, he was like the nicest guy I had ever met. You know what my problem was? Incompatible interactions judged by the outside. Yeah. You won't be a witness like you should if you judge people on the outside. Number four. Oh my goodness, number four. Oh my goodness, number four. Oh my goodness. You ready for this? Now, um, Miss Betty, this one probably won't be for you. Okay? And Miss Rosemary, probably not for you. Social media will silently train you to judge people by appearances rather than content. Silently train you. You have no idea about that person's life, only what they put on the outside. You have no idea about the character, you know, have no idea about their virtue, Men, you have no idea about that woman that you shouldn't be looking at on social media. You're just making external judgments. She will ruin your life. Therefore, therefore, you should only use social media with extreme caution and the strictest of limitations. 100% amen and amen. And it's not even... Christians who believe that. You, you ought to hear what the makers of social media say about it. They say, we, we've designed it to manipulate. You will not outthink it. It will manipulate you. They're saying that, not me. You should hear what the limitations they have for their kids on social media. Gracious sakes. Social media trains you to judge people, silently trains you to judge people on the outside. Amen, amen. Practically, isn't it? And it's so practical, isn't it? Number five. I'm going to try to hurry on this. James is not teaching that external appearances or external factors are not important. <laughs> I just... <laughs> he says, don't judge someone on external things. Don't judge them based on how they look. That does not mean that what we wear and how we look on the outside is not important. That's not what that means. The liberal church, that's all grace, says that. That's bogus. That's bogus. When God set up the tabernacle and the temple, he said, I want my priest to wear what kind of garments? Holy, sacred garments. Apparently, that was important. What they look like on the outside was important 
to God. God says in the New Testament, women, I want you to be dressed with modest apparel. Apparently, it's important to God. The external things is important to God. You just have to balance that. I won't judge you based on what I see on the outside, but that doesn't mean what we wear on the outside isn't important. Does that make sense? Last thing is this, last thing is this. <clears throat> In order to be a strong church that pleases God, we don't need to share a lot of common interests with each other. But we do need to share a common interest with Christ. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. In order to be a strong church that pleases God, we don't need to share a lot of common interests with each other but we do need to share a common interest in Christ. Amen. Rick. It's Rick. I've known Rick since 2000, maybe 1999. That's a long time. Um, he was, we are both aging. <laughs> he was in the youth group. I was a youth leader before I went off to uh, Bible college. Um, okay, question for you. Have you ever ran a 10 miler? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever shredded down some of those mountain bike trails on Mount Lemon in Tucson on a mountain bike? Well, you've been teaching me how to ride a bike, so that's definitely no. Uh. Uh. Have you ever heard me sing a song and been like, man, pastor is talented. He's got an amazing voice. <laughs> Have you ever done that? No. <laughs> There's so many differences here. That doesn't keep us from being close. See, what Satan wants us to think is, oh, all the people that I worship with, they're so different. But James uses the, look, how much more different can you get than the affluent in the same church as the poor? They have different apparel. They have different likes. They have different hygiene. They have different everything. And yet they were in the same church and God said, you can still thrive together because sharing common interests is not what you need to thrive together. But what you will need is a common interest in reflecting Christ. And I love Rick and he's a friend to me. And he tells me he loves me. And it's not because we have all these common interests in life, but we do share a common passion to serve Christ. Amen. And that overcomes all the external differences that we have. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Thank you. Naya, if Naya is in here, you can come to the piano. I'll leave you with uh, the the true statement that I gave you. And I'm not sure how the Lord maybe has spoken to your heart. Maybe just a determination. Look, we know we shouldn't judge people based on external things, but it's so hard. Sometimes it's so hard. So let me leave you with this statement, and then I'm going to let you respond to the Lord as he has dealt with your heart. Believers who are serious about being Christ-like will refuse to let external experience, uh, appearances or stereotypes determine how they interact with others. We don't let appearances determine how we interact with people. I will spend time getting to know you, getting to know your character, loving you as I love myself, because that's what Christ did to us. My great God, I come before you today. It's something that we have to work through all the time. I have to work through this as a pastor. Someone walks through the doors and my mind wants to race uh, w whether or not this person is interested or not. 
All of us have to work through that. I'm so thankful, Lord, you never treated us that way. I'm so thankful, my great God, that you look beyond what others could see on the outside. You look beyond my reputation and you looked on the inside to see the potential that, that was inside of me once you touched my heart and once you gave me an opportunity to live for you. I pray that we would treat other people, make a determination to treat other people that same way that you treat us. Please help us to do that. That we might live our lives in a way that associates with Christ, where others would see Christ in us, filled with love for people. Help us with that this morning, would you please? We ask it in Christ's name.